The topic Marx's debt to Hegel is neither merely academic, nor does it pertain only to the historical period of Marx's lifetime. From the Hungarian Revolt to the African Revolutions, from the student demonstrators in Japan to the Negro Revolutions in the US, the struggle for freedom has transformed reality and pulled to Galen dialectics out of the academic halls and philosophy books onto the living stages of history. It is true that this transformation of Hegel into a contemporary has been via Marx. It is no accident, however, that Russian communism's attack on Marx has been via Hegel. Because they recognise in the so-called mystical absolute, the negation of the negation, the revolution against themselves, Hegel remains so alive and worrisome to the Russian rules today. Ever since Zhdanov, in 1947, demanded that the Russian philosophers find nothing short of a new dialectical law, or rather declared criticism and self-criticism to be that alleged new dialectical law to replace the Hegelian objective law of development for contradiction, up to the 21st Congress of the Russian Communist Party with a special philosophic sessions declared Khrushchev to be the true humanist, the attack on both the young Marx and the mystic Hegel has been continuous. It reached a climax in 1955 attacks on Marx's early essays and theory. In actuality, it came to life as the Sino-Soviet Pact to put down the Hungarian Revolution. One thing these intellectual bureaucrats sense correctly, Hegel's concept of the absolute and the international struggle for freedom are not as far apart as would appear on the surface. Part 1. The ideal and the real are never far apart. It is this which Marx gained from Hegel. It is this which enabled the young Marx, once he broke from bourgeois society, to break also with the vulgar communists of his day who thought that one negation, the abolition of private property, would end all the ills of the old society and be the new communal society. Marx insisted on what is central to Hegelian philosophy, the fear of alienation, from which he concluded that the alienation of man does not end with the abolition of private property, unless what is most alien of all in bourgeois society, the alienation of man's labour from the activity of self-development into an appendage to a machine, is abrogated. In the place of the alienation of labour, Marx placed not a new property form, but, quote, the full and free development of the individual. The pluridimensional in Hegel, his presumption of the infinite capacities of man to grasp through the absolute, not as something isolated in heaven, but as a dimension of the human being, reveals what a great distance humanity had travelled from Aristotle's absolutes. Because Aristotle lived in society based on slavery, his absolutes ended pure form. Mind of man would meet mind of God and contemplate how wondrous things are. Because Hegel's absolutes emerged out of the French Revolution, which put an end to serfdom, Hegel's absolutes breathed the air, the earthly air of freedom. Even when one reads absolute mind as God, one cannot escape the earthly quality of the unity of theory and practice and grasp through to the absolute reality as man's attainment of total freedom, inner and outer, and temporal. The bondsman, having through his labour gained, as Hegel put it, quote, a mind of his own, end quote, becomes part of the struggle between consciousness and self and consciousness for itself, or more popularly stated, the struggle against alienation becomes the attainment of freedom. In Hegel's absolutes, there is embedded, though in abstract form, the full development of what Marx would have called the social individual, and what Marx called individuality, quote, purified of all that interfered with its universalism, i.e. freedom itself. Freedom to Hegel was not his only point of departure, it was his point of return. This is what makes him so contemporary. This was the bridge not only to Marx, but to our day, and it was built by Hegel himself. As Lenin was to discover when he returned to the Marxian philosophic foundations in Hegel during World War I, the revolutionary spirit of the dialectic was not superimposed upon Hegel by Marx, it is in Hegel. Part 2. Marx's critique of, and indebtedness to, the Hegelian dialectic. The communists are not the only ones who try to spirit away the integrality of Marxist and Hegelian philosophy. Academics also think that Marx is so strange a progeny that he has transformed Hegelian dialectics to the point of non-recognition, if not outright perversion. Whether what Herbert Melville called the shock of recognition will come upon us at the end of this discussion remains to be seen, but it is clearly discernible in Marx. Marx's intellectual development reveals two basic stages of internalising and transcending Hegel. The first took place during the period of his break with the young Hegelians, and thrust at them the accusation that they were dehumanising the idea. It was the period when he wrote both his criticism of the Hegelian philosophy of right and the criticism of Hegelian dialectic. There was nothing mechanic about Marx's new materialistic outlook. Social existence determines consciousness, but it is not a confining wall that prevents one sensing and even seeing the elements of the new society. In Hegel, too, not only continuity is relation between past and present, but is attraction exerted by the future on the present, and by the whole, even when it does not exist yet, on its parts, is the mainspring of the dialectic. 
It helped the young Marx to found a new stage of world consciousness of the proletariat in seeing that the material base was not what Marx called vulgar, but on the contrary, released the subject striving to remake the world. Marx was not one to forget his intellectual indebtedness either to classical political economy or philosophy. Although he had transformed both into a new world outlook, rooted solidly in the actual struggles of the day, the sources remained the law of value of Smith and Ricardo and Hegelian dialectics. Of course, Marx criticised Hegel sharply for treating objective history as if it were that, were the development of some world spirit and analysing self-development of mind as if its ideas floated somewhere between heaven and earth, as if the brain was not in the head of the body of man living in a certain environment and a specific historic period. Indeed, Hegel himself would be incomprehensible if we did not keep in front of our minds the historic period in which he lived, that of the French Revolution and Napoleon. And no matter how abstract the language, Hegel indeed had his finger on the pulse of human history. Marx's critique of the game in dialectic is at the same time a critique of the materialist critics of Hegel, including Feuerbach, who had treated, quote, the negation of the negation only as the contradiction of philosophy with itself, end quote. Marx reveals, contrarywise, that principle to be the expression of the movement of history itself, albeit in abstract form. Marx had finished, or rather broken off, his critique of the game in dialectic just as he reached absolute mind. Marx's rediscovery of the absolute came out of the concrete development of the class struggles under capitalism, which split the absolute into two. 1. The unemployed army which Marx called the general absolute law of capitalist development, the reserve army of unemployed. That was the negative element that would cause its collapse. And number 2. The new forces and passions, the positive elements in that negative which made the workers the gravediggers of the old society and the creators of the new. It is here, in the second stage of Marx's relation to their game and dialectic, that Marx fully transcended Hegel. The split in the philosophic category of the absolute into two, like the split of the economic category of labour into labour as activity and labour power as commodity, forged new weapons of comprehension. It enabled Marx to make a leap in thought to correspond to the new, the creative activity of the workers in establishing a society on totally new foundations which would, once and for all, abolish the division between mental and manual labour and unfold the full potentialities of man a truly new human dimension. Part 3. The Human Dimension Of course it is true that Hegel worked out all the contradictions in thought alone, while in life all contradictions remained, multiplied, intensified. Of course, where the class struggle did not abolish contradictions, those contradictions plagued not only economy, but its fingers. Of course, Marx wrote, at the beginning of the first capitalist crisis, the ideologists turned into, quote, prize fighters for capitalism, end quote. But first and foremost, Marx did not separate ideology and economics as if the latter were the only fundamental, and the former nothing but show. Marx maintains that they are both as real as life. Throughout his greatest theoretic work, Capital, Marx castigates the fetishism of commodities not only because relations of men at production appear as things, but especially because human relations under capitalism are so perverse that that is not appearance, that is indeed what they really are. Machine is master of man, not man of machine. Marx's main point was that the driving force of the dialectic was man himself, not just his thought, but the whole of man, beginning with the alienated man at the point of production, and that, whereas bourgeois ideologists, because of their place in production, have a false consciousness because they must defend the status quo, and are, quote, prisoners of the fetishism of commodities, end quote, the proletarian, because of his place in production, is the negative principle driving to a resolution of contradictions. In the history of philosophy, Hegel had written, quote, it is not so much from as through slavery that man acquired freedom." End quote. Again we see that praxis was not Marx's discovery, but Hegel's. What Marx did was to designate praxis as the class struggle activity of the proletariat. In Hegel's theory too, praxis stands higher than the ideal of cognition, because it has, quote, not only the dignity of the universal, but is simply actual. End quote. It is true that Hegel himself threw a mystic veil over his philosophy by treating it as a closed ontological system. But it would be a complete misreading of Hegel's philosophy were we to think that his absolute is either a mere reflection of the separation between philosopher and the world of material production, or that his absolute is the empty absolute or pure or intellectual intuition of the subjective idealists from Fichte through Jacobi to Schelling, whose type of bare unity of subject and object, as Professor Bailey has so brilliantly phrased it, begin, quote, possessed objectivity as the price of being inarticulate, end quote. Whether, as with Hegel, Christianity is taken at the point of departure, or whether, as with Marx, the point of departure is the material condition for freedom created by the Industrial Revolution, the essential element is self-evident. Man has to fight to gain freedom. 
thereby has revealed the negative character of modern society. Now, the principle of negativity was not Marx's discovery. He simply named it, quote, the living worker, end quote. The discovery of the principle was Hegel's. In the end, spirit itself finds that it no longer is antagonistic to the world, but is indeed the indwelling spirit of a community. As Hegel put in his early writings, begin, quote, the absolute moral totality is nothing else than a people, and the people who receive such an element as a natural principle have the mission of applying it, end quote. The humanism of Hegel may not be the most obvious characteristic of the most complex philosophy, and, in part, it was hidden even from Marx, although Lenin in his day caught it even in the simple description of the doctrine of the notion, begin, quote, as the realm of subjectivity or freedom, end quote, or man achieving freedom not as a possession, but a dimension of his being. It is this dimension of the human personality which Marx saw in the historic struggles of the proletariat that would once and for all put an end to all class divisions and open up the vast potentialities of the human being so alienated in class societies, so degraded by the division of mental and manual labour that not only is the work of being made into an appendage of a machine, but the scientist builds on a principle which would lead society to the edge of an abyss. 100 years before Hiroshima, Marx wrote, begin quote, To have one basis for science and other for life is a priori, a lie. End quote. We have lived this lie for so long that the fate of civilization, not merely rhetorically, but literally, is within orbit of a nuclear ICBM. Since the very survival of mankind hangs in the balance between the East's and the West's nuclear terror, we must, this time, under the penalty of death, unite theory and practice in the struggle for freedom, thereby abolishing the division between philosophy and reality, and giving ear to the urgency of realising philosophy, i.e. of making freedom a reality.